Hey, it's John. Thanks for checking out this session of the Listener's Commentary. I pray it's super helpful to your understanding of the Bible and your ability to follow Jesus. What many people don't know is that the Listener's Commentary is an entirely crowdfunded project, which means it's made possible by the generosity of supporters just like you. And so thank you to every one of you who supports the project. And if you want to help support this project so that it can continue to grow and expand and I can continue to produce these commentaries, just swing on over to the listenerscommentary.com, click give, and you can support right through there. Thanks so much. Welcome back to the Listener's Commentary on the Letter of James. In this session, we're going to look at James 2, 14 through 26. And this is a well-known paragraph in the letter of James, probably one of the most well-known paragraphs. It's where James takes up the topic of faith and works and the relationship between the two. James wants his original audience and us as well to recognize that while indeed we are saved by faith, it's not just faith by itself. It's not faith alone, if you will. It's not faith that's devoid of works. In fact, it's this very paragraph that caused the uh, reformer Martin Luther to dislike the book of James and to refer to it as an epistle of straw because Luther was reacting to the emphasis on works in the Catholic Church of his day. And his great epiphany was that uh, we are justified by faith apart from works of the law, as Paul states in Romans. And Luther had his own take on that, and I think he misunderstood some things James was saying and Paul was saying. And we'll talk a little bit about that more as we kind of wrap up this section at the end. But it is this paragraph that really raised that issue for, for Luther, because James is emphatic that faith is what saves, but it's not just faith by itself. James states the topic very starkly and very clearly with a... Uh, set of two questions in the opening verse. Listen to James chapter 2, verse 14. James writes, What use is it, my brethren, if a man, literally, if someone? That's important for, I think, kind of how things are written a little later in the paragraph. So, if a man, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works, what use is that? If someone says he has faith but has no works. The second follow-up question to that is, can that faith save him? And James's assumption is, no, indeed it can't. And that's what he's going to argue in then the rest of the paragraph. So, what use is it if someone says he has faith but has no works, has no deeds to evidence that faith? Can that faith save him? James then, in verses 15 and 16, gives an example of how this might play out. Here is the kind of thing that might uh, show up in James's community, James's churches that he's writing to, uh, on this issue of here's a way faith without works might show up. And it's a very apropos example, particularly based on the preceding section that had to do with mercy and compassion and caring for needy people and the prejudgment sometimes we make about needy people. So verses 15 and 16 use an example again from James's world about poverty and people in need. And so he writes the example this way. Verse 15, if a brother or a sister is without clothing and in need of daily food. So here is our topic. Here is a needy person. They lack necessary clothing and necessary food. And so if a brother or sister is without uh, clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, again, literally, someone. So this is our someone again. Someone says to you, go in peace, be warmed and be filled. And yet, you don't give them what they need, what's necessary for their body? What use is that? And that's a specific example of, oh, you say you're a believer, you say you believe God, you say you love Jesus, but here's somebody who has very tangible, practical needs, and you just give them an empty greeting. Go in peace, be warmed and be filled. And how are they going to be warm and how are they going to be filled if you don't provide them the clothes and you don't provide them the food for warmth and filling? And so it's an example of faith without works. And he says, what use is that? That's the great question. What use is that kind of faith to say you believe in, in God, you believe in Jesus, but you 
offer no practical help to somebody with very obvious practical needs. And so James follows up his illustration there in verses 15 and 16 with the point of the illustration in verse 17. Even so, even so as a transition is always going to draw us towards the conclusion of the comparison. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. There's James's point from the illustration. And so, can faith without works save, as James asked in verse 14, and his answer, as made obvious in verse 17, is, no, it can't. It is dead. It's by itself. It's all alone. It is faith that has no practical use, no practical value. So, he says, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead. It is lifeless. It is all alone and empty. Now, James at that point has stated the basic point he wants to make in this paragraph. In verses 18 and following, there is some sort of dialogue between an imaginary debater and James himself. The reason I say some sort is that verses 18 and 19, even down into verse 20 at times, there has been all sorts of scholarly debate about how to understand these verses. Uh, and the reason for that is that the grammar is unclear and a bit complicated. But the point James is making is very clear in spite of the fact that James's grammar leaves us a little confused at exactly what his, how he's trying to state things. So the way verses 18 and 19 work is some sort of debate partner, some sort of imaginary hypothetical questioner responds to James's point about faith by itself being dead, and then James responds to that debate partner. The problem is, in Greek, there was no quotation marks, and so we don't know where the words of the debate partner begin and end, and where James's response begins. That's just not clear because we don't have quote marks. Also, a few other technical things make it difficult is verse 18 begins with a strong adversive, but or however. And so verse 18 is, is clearly somebody arguing against James's point about faith. Uh, without works of being dead. It's somebody who's oppo opposing James's view because of the way uh, verse 18 begins with but, however. And so we have to respect that contrast when we read what follows. And if we, if we take it as somebody agreeing with James, that doesn't make sense of that strong contrast at the beginning of verse 18. So that little grammatical word adds some difficulty. So the lack of quotation marks and the strong contrast at the beginning of verse 18 uh, leads to some grammatical difficulties that uh, is hard for us to understand exactly James, the way James has written it. But the point is clear. So let's not lose that as we work down through these verses uh, about um, what James is actually saying. Okay? Let me just highlight just real quickly a couple options and then give you what I think is actually going on in verses 18 and 19. One is that the whole of verse 18 is the statement of the opponent, the one opposing James's view. And so the opponent would say in verse 18, uh, someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. The problem is, is if those are all the words of the opponent, it sounds like the opponent is agreeing with James, not opposing his view. And yet we know verse 18 begins with an opposition, a contrast. And so that's, that doesn't seem to totally work. Some have suggested, well, maybe the words of the opponent go all the way into verse 19. And yet again, it's like, but it seems like that would be merely restating James's view, not opposing James's view, if, if that works. So here's what I think is happening in verses 18 and 19. I think the opponent, he states his case in just the initial 
phrase of verse 18. So notice, someone may well say. Remember, we have someone earlier who said, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works. And someone among you says, go, be warmed and be filled. And now we have someone says. So I think the first half of verse 18 is the someone who believes in faith apart from works and who practices oh, faith apart from works. That makes the most sense logically of the connection between someone and someone in verse 14 and someone in verse 16 and now someone in verse 18. So this someone says, he's the opponent. He's the one who thinks you can have faith without works. He's the one who practices faith without works. So this someone says, the opponent, you have faith and I have works. Now that doesn't, and that would be the end of his quote. And then James rebuts it from there. But that doesn't quite make total sense either, unless, and it's possible this is what James is doing, unless James is stating someone's position from James's perspective. So he's, James is offering someone's point of view, but he's offering it from James's perspective. And so the someone says, in essence, um, that, oh, you have faith, I have works, the I being James, the you being someone. Um, and so James is restating someone's perspective from his side of the argument. This is the, perspe this is the uh, interpretation of Craig Blomberg and, and his commentary on James, Blomberg and Camel in the Zondervan Exegetical Commentary on the New Testament. This is his understanding of it. And it's not without its own grammatical confusions because of having to restate it from James's perspective. But you could see how it would work. Um, the someone is essentially arguing that it's possible for, for someone to have faith and someone to have works, and those two can be separate, separate from each other. And then the quote ends from someone midway through verse 18 after works. And then at that point, James picks up and re rebuts someone's perspective. That's the way I think we should best understand this. And so here's how verse 18 then would read. Someone uh, may well say that, oh, you have faith. I, James, has works. Okay, all well and good. In quote from someone, now James picks up and says, okay, fine, someone. You show me your faith without the works. Go ahead, someone, try that. Just show me your faith without the works. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Show me your faith without the works. And then James says, I, James, will show you my faith by my works. And obviously, James, that's James's whole point is, it's the works that evidence the faith. It's the works that demonstrate the faith. Um, so someone is supposed to show their faith without works, and James is like, it just isn't going to happen. And I'll show you my faith by my works. Then James goes on in verse 19 and says, you believe that uh, God is one. This is the standard Jewish profession of faith. All right, Remember, James is a Jew, a Jewish believer in Jesus, writing to Jewish believers in Jesus. And the standard Jewish confession is God is one. In fact, uh, most Jewish believers, most Jews of the first century, whether believers in Jesus or not, would restate the Shema morning and evening. The Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6 is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And so this is the standard Jewish confession. So you believe that God is one. You make this profession of faith. You have this basic faith. You believe that God is one. You do well. Almost sarcastically. Great. That's nice. You believe that God is one. Nice. How nice for you. Then James says, the demons also believe. The demons believe in God. They know who God is. They believe in him. Uh, and they shudder. And the point seems to be even the demons have some sort of uh, active response. Their belief in God has some sort of visible response. They, they shudder. The idea of shudder is they tremble in fear at the majesty and power of God and their judgment really under God's holiness and greatness. And so even the demons have some sort of visible active response because of their belief. And that's James's point, that true faith, saving faith, 
cannot be devoid of some sort of active response. That is the only evidence of faith, is that there will be some sort of active re response. You cannot separate the two. And so this someone thinks you can separate him. He can just have faith and do nothing. Um, and James is like, they cannot be separated. And that's the point. So even with all the grammatical difficulties, that even though there's different ways grammatical scholars try to sort out where the quote marks go and how the argument goes, the point is totally clear. Faith cannot be separate or devoid of works. That genuine faith, real faith, is always going to evidence itself in works. And so verse 20 then goes on and says this, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, James now speaking directly to the someone, this debate partner who has advocated trying to separate the two, James now says, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? At this point in the argument, James speaking to this hypothetical someone, this hypothetical debate partner, he's basically you know, challenging them in his rebuttal, are you willing to acknowledge, are you willing to know, recognize, acknowledge that faith without works is useless? Then James goes on in verse 21, and he, he gives now several examples from the Old Testament to make this point. Examples that would have been well-known and well-respected well by his audience, because remember, they are believing Jews. And so, verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? And so, James calls to mind the event recorded in Genesis 22 about Abraham and Isaac and Abraham offering up Isaac. Abraham is the not, he's not just a random example from the Old Testament that James has ransacked. Abraham is the poster boy of faith. He is the founding father of the Jewish people and the, the Jewish nation in the long run. He is uh, the one who was originally justified by faith when God declared him righteous because Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. In fact, James is going to go on in a second. And quote that. And so Abraham is the, the great patriarch and the, the father of faith for the Jewish people. And James calls this uh, event to mind where James's initial faith in God, evidenced by his trusting God's promise that he would have a son, is brought to fulfillment, brought to completion, brought to maturity, if you will, by this great act of trusting God, even in this moment of saying, if God wants me to offer up my son, somehow God is still going to uh, provide a, a, a lineage for me, provide descendants and offspring. For, somehow God is going to fulfill his promise. And Abraham trusted God with that. And so his faith was evidenced in his works. And so he, he James goes on in verse 22 and says, so you see that faith was working with his works. His, these two were working together, and that is what I think we really need to make sure we understand how James is articulating this. It's not faith plus works. It's not faith even that, um, you know, faith and works. It's a faith that works. That's really important. A faith that works. Those, they work together. They work in sync. They work in partnership together. They, they go together as the faith expresses itself in deeds. And that's just the way faith naturally works. All faith, religious faith, non-religious faith, it, it expresses itself in deeds. That's why you can look at a person's life in total and you can tell what they really believe based on their life in total, because our life, by and large, runs on the rails of our beliefs. And so the things we do uh, evidence and demonstrate what we genuinely and truly believe. And so Abraham had such confidence in God and that God could fulfill his promise for offspring, even offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, that his faith verse 22, was working with his works, 
and as a result of the works, his faith was perfected. The idea of faith being perfected there is faith was brought to fulfillment. Faith was brought to completion. It reached its goal. It came to maturity is the idea of that. And so his faith was perfected. It was completed. And the scripture, moving on into James 2.23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Uh, that quote is from Genesis 15, 6, where God has made this great promise to Abraham, restated the promise that he's going to have descendants as the stars of the sky, and Abraham believed God. He believed that specific promise that God, even though he was old, even though his wife was old, even though he hadn't, didn't have any kids, he believed that somehow God was going to give him descendants. And so, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, he was justified. That's the basic idea of that. In, in fact, the Apostle Paul uses the same passage to make his point in Romans chapter 4. He was reckoned as righteous. He was credited, is the idea of reckon. It was credited to his count that he was righteous. So his faith got him counted as righteousness, and thus he was justified. And so he was called the friend of God simply because of his faith. That faith was evidenced in the action with Isaac in Genesis 22, many years later. So that's James's first example from the Old Testament. Abraham. Abraham, his faith wasn't um, devoid of works. His faith evidenced itself in works. So James states the point of the example of Abraham in verse 24. James says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And that's the specific verse that got Martin Luther all twisted up in knots because he was interpreting it through the grid of his experience uh, and particularly his experience of the Roman Catholic Church of his day, and how that impacted him as a Catholic monk. Nevertheless, it's a very important point that James is making, regardless of how Luther heard it and experienced it. James's point is that there, there is a kind of works that is inherent to our justification. It is the kind of works that flow from faith. James isn't saying you have to be perfect. James isn't saying you have to keep the Old Testament law. James isn't saying you have to keep every moral instruction of God perfectly. What James is saying is trusting someone will show up in your behavior. So trusting God, likewise, will show up in the things you do, in your behavior. Again, not perfect obedience. James isn't advocating that. He is simply saying that to have confidence in someone and to trust them will manifest itself in the things you do and in the way you act. That is evident in Abraham's life and in the things he did and in the way he acted, even though he wasn't a perfect man, as the record of Genesis clearly shows. Nevertheless, his faith did show up in works, and that is James's point. Verse 24, so you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. There will be obedience. There will be um, a carrying out and uh, an evidence of your faith. Now, in verse 25, James offers a second Old Testament example, a really unique one. It's this one. Verse 25 says, and in the same way, like Abraham, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Again, she re, uh, James is recalling this story from the book of Joshua where the uh, Israelites are preparing for their uh, conquest of Canaan and Rahab in the city of Jericho harbors these spies who have come and she hid them on the roof of her house and when men came looking for them she said I think they left by this direction and she sent them off in the wrong direction and then she shooed the spies off to go back to her own land and she basically said just make sure you you protect me and I don't die in your conquest of the city because I've heard of all the great things that Yahweh has done all the mighty things that Yahweh has done in and through 
you. And they gave her specific instructions on what to do so that when they came to attack the city, she and everyone in her house would be saved. It's that event that James calls to mind out of the book of Joshua to make the same point, that she did that, that when they came to conquer the city, uh, Rahab followed their advice because of her confidence in their word and what she had heard about Yahweh and her budding, incipient, young faith in Yahweh, as basic as it was, she followed their instructions because she had confidence in Yahweh, and it is what got her saved, delivered from the initial conquest, and presumably saved in the long term for all eternity. And so she was justified by the action that evidenced her faith. And so James states the conclusion then of this whole argument in verse 26 by saying, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, you separate the spirit from the body, That's the, that, that in and of itself is the basic definition of death. So just as the spotty body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. It's dead. It's a dead faith. And that is James's point. And so James has argued here in verses 14 through 26 uh, for his case very strongly that you cannot separate faith and works. You cannot just have faith without any evidence of it in your behaviors. All right, now before we leave this paragraph, we do need to raise this question. How does James reconcile with Paul on this teaching about justification and faith and works? Is James saying something other than Paul? James has said, as we noted in verse 24, that you see a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. But the Apostle Paul, particularly in Romans and in Galatians, seems to argue the opposite. Listen to these words from Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Paul writes, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And thus he seems to be saying something very different than what James is saying. So how do we reconcile these two? First off, we need to note that James and Paul are writing to two very different audiences, addressing two very different issues, and that's really important. James is writing to a group of Jewish believers in Jesus, who, to some degree or another, are, at least there's some people among them, someone among them, who's saying, oh, you can have faith without any obedience, without any good works whatsoever. That's James's audience. Paul is writing to a, a mixed audience of Jews and Gentiles that are predominantly Gentile, and they are being encouraged to not just have general works of obedience, they're being encouraged to obey the Old Testament law, and that in order to be genuinely part of the people of God, they actually have to keep the Old Testament. That, that is a radically different issue than James is addressing. And that's really important. So you hear there in Romans 3.28 where Paul says, We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart, catch this phrase, apart from works of the law. See, Paul's not arguing against works in general. Paul is arguing against a very specific kind of works, specifically Old Testament works, circumcision, Sabbath keeping, food laws, and the like. And what Paul is arguing is that a person is justified, that is, counted as righteous and made a part of the family of God, outside of and apart from the Old Testament law. That the Old Testament law was a covenant with God, of God with Israel. God's covenant people now are formed in Messiah, not in Torah, not in the Old Testament law. And so you are justified, declared righteous, and made part of God's family simply by your faith in Jesus, not by keeping the Old Testament law. But when it comes to general obedience and works of obedience, Paul can sound very much like James. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, Paul summarizes his ministry in Romans 1, 5 by saying the goal of his ministry is, catch this, the obedience of faith among the Gentiles. That is exactly the point James is arguing for in James chapter 2, that 
faith will manifest itself in obedience, in good works, in, in living out God's ways. And Paul says that's what he's working for in his ministry is the obedience of faith. Romans 1.5, he even restates that in Romans 16.26, uses that same phrase, working for the obedience of faith. Or the classic text uh, that's often quoted to be saved apart from works is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, that we are saved by grace through faith, he says. But verse 10 is emphatic, for good works, that to be saved by grace through faith will manifest itself in good works. So Paul can sound very much like James on this point. And so is Paul and James, are they opposed to each other? No, they are not. Um, they're arguing for two different cases to two different audiences, and so sometimes their language sounds opposed. But if you read Paul more closely, you'll hear Paul sounds very much like James. He believes that, that a saving faith is a faith that works. And the reason for that is because, as I already noted, to believe something is to live like it's true. If you believe God, if you believe God is wise, if you believe that God's uh, truth and instruction is the best way to live, you will live like it's true. And so if you have confidence in what Jesus taught, if you have confidence in Jesus' way, then you will live like that's true. Again, not perfectly. We're not Neither Paul nor James is arguing for perfection. They are arguing for a faith that manifests itself in deeds as carried out in grace and under grace before God. And thus, the life of faith is a life of confident trust in God that manifests itself in the way we conduct our life.